Hey everyone, welcome back to Peak Human Podcast. This is Brian Sanders, and I want to urge everyone to go back to episode one. Start back then. You can see the whole evolution of my thinking. You can get all the great episodes. I have no sponsors, so I don't have to keep to any schedule. I don't have to have anyone on that I don't think is going to be great. So that's why I think they are all great. You can also give this podcast a review on iTunes. That helps. That's free. Share with a family or friend. And before I get to this great interview with Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, I'll tell you about my big update. I'm getting closer to signing the lease on the Austin Community Center. I mentioned it last time. I'll talk about it really quickly again here in East Austin for nose to tail headquarters for a community center for the Sapien Wellness Health Everything Event Center. So yes, we would have nose to tail products. We would have nose to tail food. We would have events. We would have a gym space. We have co-working space. We have indoor, outdoor. We have sauna cold plunge, barbecue, fire pit. We have it all. This is the ultimate ancestral health center. We will be having events all throughout the week, events on the weekend, distributing meat, not having to ship it out to people. You can get in person, get all the primal ground beef from nose to tail with the organs mixed in, get the low pufa pork and chicken, get all the stuff, all the pasture raised, wild crafted, organic, everything, top of the line stuff. Instead of getting it through the mail, you can get it from us. We can ship it out. We're working with my friend as well to use an app to get it out to people with very quick delivery. So lots of updates there. If you want to be a part of this, please email me. You can email me at hi at foodlies.org, just hi at foodlies.org. Any way you want to get involved, we're looking for investors all the way down to just members. If you want to pre-order your membership for a year, we have discounts. We're looking for founding partners. We're looking for people to help build this out. We're looking for anyone who wants to get involved and be part of this amazing community we have in Austin. Even if you're not in Austin, there may be some way to get involved. Just email me, hi at foodlies.org. Super excited about this. I've been working on this for a year and a half before I even moved to Austin. This is the dream. So other than that, you can go to nosetotail.org and get all the great products there. I'll quickly mention our great stuff. We have the seasonings. We have the body care. We still have soap. We still have some of that great stuff in stock. We have all the meats I mentioned, plus more. We have bison, we have lamb. We've got the biltong. We've got the drovors, the stick version. We've got the one with liver in it, liverors. Best way to get grass-fed meat on the go. Get your organs in on the go in a delicious snack. And now more about my guest, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. He is a general practitioner in medicine from Scotland and focuses the bulk of his research and writing on cholesterol, atherosclerosis, stress, and the myths around them. He is an outspoken critic of the cholesterol focus of heart disease, overprescription of medications, and the dirty plays of statistics that some doctors use to increase their gains at the expense of of their patients and general population. He is the author of three books, The Clot Thickens, Doctoring Data, and The Cholesterol Con, and runs the website drmalcolmkendrick.org. I had a really great time talking to him. I think you're gonna love him. I've been listening to his content for years. He fights all the narratives. He fights the good fight. He's been against a lot of the stuff that's gone on in the past two years, even though we don't really get into it. I have to take a break from talking about that stuff. But he is the man. Please enjoy this episode. Please go to sapien.org. Check out what we're doing there. We have the program. We have the Sapien tribe. You can even go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash peakhuman. Support the show there. Get the extended show notes. Go to nosetail.org, of course. Follow me at Food Lies on social media. And let's get on to the show with Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. We're live with Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Apart from having a bit of a, a bit of a cold and a bit of a sore throat, so I sound a bit more like uh, Barry White than I normally do. Uh, sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Where are you calling in from? Well, I live in uh, the UK, just south of Manchester, so it is uh, 4 p.m. where I am, and we've just had snow today, so it's been quite. The weather has changed. <laughs> oh wow! I'm about to go <laughs> play beach volleyball today here in Austin, but. Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I won't rub that in, but um, yeah, we have some mutual friends. I just did a podcast with Zoe Harcomb yesterday. We got a mutual friend, Ivor Cummins, who's great, talks a lot about cholesterol. I've listened to your content over the years, probably a lot through Ivor. So yeah, I'm very, very familiar with your work. Um, I got your book right here, The Clot Thickens. Yeah, so the greatest book ever written. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know what's the best part about this book? 
you, your personality is shining through. It is hilarious. Man, thank you. <laughs> it is. It's so great because it's a scientific book. Well, it's approachable for anyone, but it's even more approachable because you throw in humor every page, really. Well, I, I, some people hate it, but uh, some people love it. So, well, you can't please everybody. But I think uh, for myself, a lot of people, if you make them laugh for a bit, they carry on and think, oh, well, I might as well keep going for a bit longer. I'm getting a bit of a laugh out of it as well. So it's, uh, you know, uh, a wise man once said, humor is just a funny way of being serious. Yeah. I mean, it's a serious topic, right? We're talking about heart disease, yet you, you made it funny. So let's jump in. You know, I'm going to make a bold claim here. By the end of this episode, I think the listener will have what I think is the best model of heart disease that kind of just explains everything and actual information on what to do to prevent it. So let's jump in. I love this sort of unifying theory stuff. I try to do that with my nutrition stuff. Like how do I get people to understand things? Uh, you know, there's so much going on. Let's simplify it as much as possible. And it's also that Einstein kind of thing, right? Like it's a theory of everything. And I think well, you've done that. You've done that and <laughs> you, yeah. you've drawn on, you know, researchers in the past and you, you, you credit researchers in the past that have come up with some of these ideas, but what, l let's l just give the audience the sort of big view of what's going on with heart disease. Well, <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, when you look at the cholesterol hypothesis, which has been the kind of the, the, the sort of big bully hypothesis for a number of years, you think you start to look at it in more detail, you think, well, it just doesn't work you know uh, it, it, you, you find so many contradictions to it and then you start looking at the process itself of what is what is heart disease what what is it you know it's interesting hardly anyone ever seems to discuss this it's almost like well, that bit's been sorted out i remember years ago but i was in medical school and this is going back hundreds of years mm -hmm. and brownvold you may know is a is this the most sort of it's, it's the book on heart disease it's like it's heart disease. It's about 4,000 pages long and it weighs about 100 kilograms of it. You can't even pick it up. It, and it's just enormous. It's the kind of the reference book. And I was reading through it trying to find out, well, what, what, you know, what causes heart disease? And you think it would be, you know, a third of the book would be on this. And I thought it was like one sort of small paragraph which just said, you know, you eat too much fat, cholesterol gets into your arteries, and that's what causes atherosclerotic heart disease. It's like, that's it. <laughs> Come on. Um, and in fact, around about that time, in fact, I was I was actually taught, uh, partly taught medicine by a, um, a cardiologist that is a female researcher, Elsa Smith, who who, who during a meeting, um, a sort of small group tutorial, said, you know, LDL, low density lipoprotein, cannot get through the endothelium. And I looked at her and I thought, I don't know what the endothelium is, and I'm not really sure what the LDL is, but yeah, the way she said it was kind of like, you know, it was like an Agatha Christie thing where the, somebody just says a little thing and that's it. You know, that's the clue to everything. And um, I wasn't particularly bothered what the theories about heart disease were or cardiovascular disease or whatever what term you want to use. I just, you know, people said it's due to the bad Scots diet. When I was did medicine, I was in Scotland and Scotland, Scotland had the highest rate of heart disease in the world. So it was quite a big deal. And everyone said it's due to the terrible Scottish diet. It's due to the terrible Scottish diet, raises your cholesterol levels, and then you get heart disease. And then I, I used to go to France quite a lot, still do. And um, I looked at the French diet and I thought, well, you know what? Boy, they sure eat a lot of saturated fat. <laughs> in fact, they eat more saturated fat than anyone else in Europe. And they have the lowest rate of heart disease from anyone in Europe and, and really low. Um, and I thought, well, you know, that, that kind of doesn't really figure. So, so I started on a pathway of of kind of thinking well what's going on what's going on for a number of years i thought that the, the reason why this the french were protected was because when they ate they were relaxed you know you have anabolism and you have catabolism and if you're under stress and you're working hard you're burning up energy stores and when you're trying to eat you're trying to absorb energy stores and the enzymes in the whole process of of stress if you like or it's not necessarily a negative thing and eating you know you don't want to have these two things in the same place at the same time so if you're very anxious or you just rush or you eat your food really quickly, fast food type of idea, you've got all these stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, then they're battling against insulin and then your blood sugar goes up and that's where the damage occurs. 
So, in fact, for a long time, I thought, we're looking at a football stadium. People are saying, you know, what happens in this football stadium? And the only time they ever go to visit it is when there's nobody there. So you arrive at the football stadium and you think, well, nothing's happening. And you say, well, actually, you needed to be here <laughs> when there was two teams on the pitch. 60,000 people are screaming because then you'd have seen it was a bit different. So we kept looking at the human metabolism when it was unstressed. So people would take people's blood sugar levels and say, well, your blood sugar levels are okay. Your insulin levels are okay. So we'll, we'll try doing that in the middle of a mealtime and see what happens. So I was down that pathway for a long time and then I realized that it didn't really work. Well, it worked. It's, a, it's an important part of heart disease. But actually, I started then looking at stress. There's a very, very brilliant guy called Paul Rush, who actually is now sadly died last year. It was last year or the year before. And he, he set up the American Institute for Stress. And he was a psychiatrist and a fantastic guy. And he worked with the Hungarian whose name just escaped me, who first came up with the idea of stress, and even as a concept for human beings. And he looked at me one day, we were actually at a meeting, and he said, you know, you need to, you need to, what you need to do is you need to look at process. You need to look at the process of heart disease. I looked at him and thought, oh, no idea what you're talking about. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is rubbish. I know. And then I realized I had to say to myself, what is actually going on? So what is heart? What is atherosclerotic heart disease, the formation of these thickenings and lumps in your arteries? What is going on? Now, we're all told they're all full of cholesterol. So you have cholesterol in your blood and it goes into your, into your arteries. So that's just bunk. That can't work, right? It's just an impossible, ridiculous idea. And I talk quite a lot about this when I, I discuss it with people. Assuming that's wrong, what is it? Now, if we go back to 1852, we're going back to Vienna, a time of very serious researchers with big hats and big beards. One of them was called Rudolf von uh, Rokitansky. No, that wasn't a Rudolf. It wasn't Rudolf Rokitansky. It was Rudolf was Verko. I've just forgotten who it was. Anyway. The sick name was Rokitansky, Von Rokitansky. Mm -hmm. And he, would look, he was looking at atherosclerotic plaques. And he said, his idea was, and what I'm looking at, what I'm seeing here is blood clots. I'm seeing blood clots in various stages of repair and metamorphosis. And that's what an atherosclerotic plaque is. It's a blood clot. It's not necessarily exactly what you see in a blood clot, because after time it degenerates and turns into other things. <coughs> Carl Von Rokitansky, that's right, not Rudolf. And um, the problem we had was that Rudolf, Rudolf Verko, who was working at the time in Vienna, said, well, you know what, how do you get a blood clot inside the artery wall? Because blood clots form in the bloodstream, and you're seeing blood clots in the artery wall, and then we know there's a lining between them. So how does a blood clot get across that lining? And Rokitansky had no explanation for this. So that idea kind of got kicked into touch. Verko was the first one to say, well, clots have got cholesterol crystals in them, and he... Some people consider the father of the cholesterol hypothesis. But actually, he said at the time that it's a very late stage development to see cholesterol in a, in a plaque. This doesn't happen until, what, you know, people have been around for about 40 years or something. But anyway, that's so that stage of that thinking. <clears throat> but other people picked up on this over the years. There was a, after the Second World War, there was quite a big interest in blood clotting and cardiovascular disease. And then Ansel Keys came along and convinced everyone that it was all to do with diet. It was all saturated fat and it was cholesterol. And, and, that, and that kind of won the, won the day. And that became the defining idea. And it became very difficult to go against this. So um, even when you go back to the, to the 1980s, this, this lady that, uh, that taught me, Elspeth Smith, her ideas just never took off because well, she was fighting against, at that time, statins were beginning to arrive. There was huge amounts of money involved in statin prescribing, and this hypothesis just got kicked into touch. And the guy, Ronald Ross, who's talked about the response to injury hypothesis as well. But if you pick it up on their work, it's almost like, I don't know if you've heard of the ghost in the machine. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember who came up with it. Anyway, it was the idea that yeah, if you look around, you'll find that there is signs of stuff that's been there all the time. It's in the background, and, and there's a voice, there's ghostly voices, if you like. And and they never really listen to. And then you go and look and you say, correct, there's an awful lot of this stuff about this. Is, there's an awful lot of people have been thinking about this for an awfully long time in this way. And yet, yeah, uh, your average person, your average doctor, your average researcher never even heard of it. You're not going to find you a thousand papers, ten thousand papers. Just silence them. So it's interesting. But their idea is, and I'll try and keep this as simple as possible, is that your arteries, it's only your arteries where this happens. There's only a large arteries where this happens. <clears throat> and there's reasons for that are lined by endothelial cells. 
and an endothelial cell, a bit like a wall tile, perhaps. It's, it's a trillion times more complicated than a wall tile, but they stick to the inside of your arteries and form a barrier. They do obviously a lot more than that. They release hormones and they, anyway, there's, a, there's mm -hmm. probably 20,000 things that every individual endothelial cell can do. <clears throat> Now, if you want your arteries to be healthy, your endothelium has to be healthy and it has to be un undamaged. And lying on top of your endothelium is a thing called the glycocalyx, which really strangely, no doctor that I've ever spoken to yet has ever heard of. But again, if you type glycocalyx cardiovascular disease into Google, you know, you'll have 100,000 results in 0.1 of a second or whatever it is. The glycocalyx is like a, a layer, it's like super Teflon. If you try to pick up a fish, most fish, sharks don't do this, but if you try and pick up a fish, most of them will slip through your fingers. Very slippery, you can't get hold of them. Why not? Because they're covered in glycocalyx. Mm -hmm. The glycocalyx allows, both it adds as protection, so bacteria and viruses can't get into the fish, and it acts to allow them to swim through the water nice and quickly. So it's a kind of anti-sticky layer. Mm -hmm. And we're, our arteries and all our blood vessels are signed, aligned with this anti-sticky layer, which is like fronds, the glycoprotein, which means glucose and proteins stuck together to form little fronds. And within this little forest sits 10,000 little enzymes and hormones and things as well that all help to protect your blood vessels from any damage. So they've got anticoagulant factors and they've got things that stop things sticking to them and they just act as a physical protectant as well. So if this glycocalyx is damaged or thinned, more damage can occur to your blood vessel. And you can see this, and it can be measured. You can even measure it. You know, people can measure it. So you can see bits of the glycocalyx. You can measure them floating around in your bloodstream, and you say, ah, oh, we can see that the glycocalyx has been damaged. We can also see bits of endothelial cells floating around in the bloodstream called microparticles. So if you see bits of glycocalyx floating around and bits of endothelium kicking around, we say something's been damaging the endothelium. So the endothelium, once it's damaged, the problem with damaging the endothelium is underneath it, and within the endothelium itself are all sorts of things saying don't clot, don't clot, don't clot, don't clot, don't clot. You get rid of the endothelium and the glycocalyx, and all those messages are kind of wiped out. And the blood says, shit, we've got a breach on our hands. You know, it's like in a ship, you know, water starts pouring in. Everyone rushes there and starts trying desperately to cover over the cover over the water leak. And they hammer things in and they ram it over and they make sure it's the leak is stopped. Of course it's kind of the opposite way around with an artery because it's trying to leak out. So once you get damaged to the endothelium, the body says, we must clot, we must produce a clot to block this damaged area. And at that point, of course, the endothelium is not there, which is what Rokitansky didn't know mm. and couldn't understand, which is why he couldn't answer the question. But the reason why he couldn't answer the question is, how does blood clot get from the blood stream, from the, if you like, the bloodstream side to the arteries, wall side, who, through that layer is... Well, the layer isn't there. You stripped it off, it's gone. Or it's so badly damaged that the clot just sticks to it. So the clot is now sticking to it. Now, of course, if every blood clot that's formed just got bigger and bigger and bigger, we'd all be dead. Immediately this happens. So for every 25 things making your blood clot, there's another 20, there's probably 100 things on either side. It's just the most mind-boggling and complicated system. I can't understand it. I've been reading about it for 20 years. I'm like, oh, look, there's another factor I've never heard of. You know, crikey, what does that do? Mm. <laughs> It's just unbelievably complicated. But anyway, so you've damaged your endothelium, you've damaged your glycocalyx, a blood clot is formed, it stops growing, it is then shaved away, so it's a, just a thin layer, and then new endothelial cells arrive. They're not called endothelial cells, they're called endothelial progenitor cells. They're produced in the bone marrow. They spot the area of damage, they zone in on it. I can't remember the exact word. They zone, zoning in is not the right word, but anyway. <clears throat> then they stick to it. And lots of them stick to the clot, and then they form a new layer of endothelium, and then the clot is now, hey presto, inside of the artery wall. And of course, that has to happen for other reasons, because if a, if a blood clot formed, and then and then the, the endothelium grew from underneath and pushed it off, the blood clot would just go shooting off down your artery into a narrow bit, or a jam up and cause a stroke or a heart attack. So that cannot be allowed to happen. It has to be covered over. And, and until the mid 19 90s. No one even knew endothelial progenitor cells existed. You could speculate that they must exist because otherwise, how the hell does this all happen? Mm -hmm. you know, I, I watched research from the 1960s and they did these 
horrendous experiments on animals where they scraped off the endothelium and then waited for three days and killed them and waited for 10 days and killed them and waited for 20 days and killed them and they had a look at what was going on. And they could see <clears throat> where they damaged the endothelium by scraping it, that, that there were blood clot had formed, yes, and then it had been shaved down, yes, and that these funny cells were appearing all over it. And they had no idea what they were. They couldn't work them out. You're like, well, what the hell do you think they can possibly be? Well, this is always what they are. It's the only thing they can be. But for some reason, no one just added these things together. <coughs> I mean, it has been added together now. So anyway, we're at a stage where the new endothelial cells have formed, the blood clots drawn into your artery wall, and then your repair systems get together and start chopping away at it and getting rid of it. So most, most, most cases, 99.999, I don't know what the percentage is. Once you've had a little bit of a blood clot, the systems get rid of it. It's gone. The problem occurs if you get repeated damage at the same point and the, or the repair systems are not working so well and or the clot that forms is particularly difficult to shift. So you've basically got three factors. I call it the triad. You've got endothelial glycocalyx damage. There's many things that can do that. Just to give a few examples, smoking is known to cause that. Do it. High blood sugar levels are known to do that. Turbulent flow and high blood pressure is known to do that. SARS-CoV-2 is actually known to do that <laughs> um, mm. because it gets into endothelial cells, grows, bursts out, cells die, blood clots form. People go, oh my goodness, how on earth does SARS-CoV-2 cause people to have heart attacks? Well, guys, it's pretty bloody obvious, isn't it? Anyway, um, <clears throat> so there's a multitude of things that can damage the endothelium. Lead, for example, heavy vessels. Periodontal disease is a recent one that people come up with. How does periodontal disease cause atherosclerotic plaque formation? Well, periodontal disease means you've got a chronic infection in your gums. Chronic infection in your gums, the bacteria release end exotoxins, which is the waste products of bacteria. They float around in your bloodstream. They arrive at their endothelial cells and they kill them. So you've just got quite a high rate of damage going on in your arteries. It's the same thing. The same thing as is caused by smoking, the same thing is caused by air pollution, minor particles get into your bloodstream. So all these things damage the glycocalyx and the endothelium, then a clot forms, then it's then it's healed over. So things that can make your clots more difficult to shift are gonna increase your risk of heart disease because the repair systems have got to go rid of this rather difficult, hard to shift mm -hmm. clot. So if you look at risk factors include things like fibrinogen, which is a blood clotting factor. There's a very specific clotting factor called von Willebrand's factor, which you can imagine von Willebrand, but you think he's German. He actually came from Finland. The most complicated clotting factor there is, but basically it acts to bind to platelets when they start joining together, and it holds the whole plaque and clot in against the artery wall. And if you don't have enough von Willebrand factor, this is a form of hemophilia. In other words, if you cut, you bleed more than you would otherwise. People with he, von Willebrand's disease have about a third the rate of cardiovascular diseases people who do not. Mm -hmm. There are actually there are people who've got more von Willebrand factor than average, and they have four to five times the risk of cardiovascular disease as people who have a normal level. The this difference is... between people who have a low von Willebrand factor and people who have a high von Willebrand factor is, is about 15 fold. Just to give you some idea of the separation we're seeing here. When people talk about cholesterol, even if they're right, which I don't believe they are, we're talking about 1.15%. But here we're talking about, you know, 115 times. Wait, it, we it, should stop. It's This is crazy. We should stop for a second because I, t I talked about the theory of everything. And you have to have, when you're making a theory, you, it has to make sense on all the different factors that yeah. people think cause heart disease. So you're kind of explaining all these varieties of things completely different you're talking about environmental things you're talking about smoking you're talking about uh, diet and all these different things and they all are starting to align under your theory and then you're t we oppose that with the ldl hypothesis which can't explain most of those and yeah. and so yeah so just i just wanted to make that clear for people that the ldl i mean i've, I've had five episodes on cholesterol and LDL. And, you know, I've had Dr. Seema Holtra, Dr. Brett Schur. Um, I just want people to be able to go back and listen to these. I've had Ivor Cummins talk about Dave Feldman and the last one, no, Dr. Nandir Ali. So many episodes on this to, to talk about why it's not LDL and, yeah. and because it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit all these other things that cause 
that cause heart disease? Well, no, I think, I mean, that's the thing is if you've got a hypothesis, then the number one requirement of hypothesis, two requirements. One is it's predictive. In other words, does it accurately predict what's going to happen? Um, so if someone says we're going to get a solar eclipse or, or a you know, total eclipse on June the 15th, which is going to be seen in India at 11.03 a.m., uh, we know it's going to happen. So we understand that these people have got a pretty good handle on it. With cardiovascular disease, you can look, I mean, LDL is not even used as a risk factor for the risk calculators that we use in the U.K. and the U.S. It's not even there. They use total cholesterol HDL ratio, which I'm not going to go into that now. I, I try to stay away from the LDL stuff because it's almost like everyone gets dragged back into it. It's like, well, it's just clearly nonsense. Just ignore it, you know. Or, or say to another thing, you know, okay, here's LDL, right? Here's the thing that can cause, here's the thing that can increase your risk of heart disease by 5,000%. If you're a young woman, it's a disease called systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE. You might have heard it lupus, it's sometimes called. The joke amongst doctors is it's never lupus, um, whatever your symptoms are. But sometimes it is. But if you're a young woman with lupus, your risk of cardiovascular disease is increased 5,000%. All right, compare that to LDL. I did a graph just for a laugh once and showing the, the increased risk of heart disease with raised LDL. Yes. That, that. The increased risk of heart disease with, with SLE is this. If you put them on the same graph, you can't even see the LDL increase in risk. <laughs> it's so close to zero that it doesn't even register. I can't make a graph make it show. <coughs> so we have something that increases your risk vastly, and then they say, well, well what is, does SLE increase your LDL? No. Does it have any pro impact on your lipids? No. So how does the LDL work then? Well, it clearly it doesn't. Can it? It's There's like, so many. It's like dead in the water. The theory's dead in the water. Yeah. If you can disprove something, that does a lot more to to destroy a hypothesis than than trying to like you know cherry pick evidence to try to prove it, right? Well, exactly. Yeah, that's what science is about. It's trying to disprove stuff. I have a theory, you know, and my theory is whatever it is, and um, and it sustains. If it explains, but the moment it fails to explain something, it's it's not right. It's, it's the alternative is it's wrong. But I mean, science is full of this. I use an example sometimes of the orbit of Mercury did not meet the requirements of Newtonian physics. It, it, Mercury rotated more slowly than it should have done. Right. <clears throat> so and instead of going around that speed, it went around that speed. The difference was not huge, but. It was enough that people were looking at it going, so they said, well, well, we knew Newton's theories of gravity are correct and therefore our observations are either wrong or there must be another planet there that's distorting the orbit of Mercury. And that planet was called Vulcan, as in Star Trek. And because um, it was that much closer to the sun, it was always going to be poorly hot, which is why they called it Vulcan. And people searched for Vulcan for about 40 or 50 years and several people said they'd found it and had seen it. Of course, it doesn't exist. The reason why the reason why the Mercury rotates more slowly than it's supposed to due to the impact of the gravitational field of the Earth on the space-time continuum, and time slows. And and so Einstein was right, and Newton was right-ish, but he wasn't right. But boy, people were unwilling. They started seeing this thing called ether. They said, oh, well, what's happening is that the, the solar system is moving into the, the galaxy at whatever it is, 10 million miles an hour. It's very thin ether, which means that planets hit the ether and slow down and speed up. And Mercury, because it's near the sun, is hitting more ether or hitting less ether or whatever explanation it was that they decided to come up with. And that was a mickelson morley experiment. They actually measured the rotation of all the planets around the sun and said, are they slowing down and speeding up? So as they go into the bow wave, do they slow down? As they come back, do they speed up? And the answer is no, they don't. They go exactly the same speed all the time. So the ether explanation for the orbit of Mercury was nonsense. And that was when Einstein's special theory of relativity was accepted. And, you, and it's so hard to get people to to agree. You know what? What do you? What have you got to do? I mean, the experiment. You know, there's no extra planet. There's no ether. There's none of these things. It's, you're just wrong. You know, fifty years or so of people just clinging desperately to this sort of sunk ship. And, and the, the LDL hypothesis. I say it's a bit like having a planet LDL and you blow it up and you say I've blown it up. Yep, <laughs> there's plenty of evidence to blow it up. And then the planet LDL just comes back together again because there's no other planet, there's no other gravitational field, so there's nowhere else for anyone's thinking to go. So whenever you talk about heart disease, you're dragged back to this LDL high enough cholesterol nonsense. And you say to people, okay, so how, how does LDL do it? What's the process of LDL causing heart disease? 
what is it? I mean, you've got LDL in the bloodstream, and what you're saying is, in certain parts of certain arteries, not in any veins, nothing in the lungs, the LDL decides it's going to escape out of the bloodstream and into the artery behind. Because why, why would it do this? But it's only LDL, nothing else in the blood. Smaller molecules in the blood, they're not escape. Uh, molecules of the same size in the blood, they're not escape. It's just LDL. It's LDL alone gets through, nothing else gets through. And, and it only happens in certain parts of your arteries. Because why? Because concentration is the same everywhere. So what's going on? And they go, ah, well, it obviously just gets through. Well, it must get through because it's there. You know? Now, that's not how you do logic. <laughs> well, I know that there is cholesterol inside atherosclerotic plaques. There's other explanations for that. But it can't get through the way you're saying because we know that cholesterol, LDL, the only way you can get it into a cell is you've got an LDL receptor. An LDL receptor is... An LDL comes along, an LDL receptor says hello, and it clumps onto it, it pulls it into the cell, and then it's all broken down. Yet so many LDL receptors go back to the surface. Now, if we didn't need an LDL receptor we, to get LDL in, then we wouldn't have one. And then the idea is that the LDL gets on one side of the cell and through the membrane, and then what? It travels all the way across the other side of the cell, what was it like for you or me traveling about half a mile, and then knocking on the other side of the cell membrane, going, excuse me, could you let me out? And so, I was, yeah, yeah, hold on, I'll just produce an inside out LDL receptor and I'll lock onto you and I'll pop you out the other side. Now, oh, thanks very much. What, what, why, the body go, why did I do that, by the way? Oh, well, because you just have to, because otherwise you can't get atherosclerosis. It's like, yes, that's just stupid, isn't it? The other explanation is, oh, well, the LDL is just exactly the right size to slip between the endothelial cells, a bit like going down the alleyway between two houses. And you say, okay, what you have here is, what you've got here is terraced houses. I don't know if you have terrorist houses in the States, but they're basically they're houses that are, you've got a house, you've got another house. And you might say, yeah, well, there's two houses here, but there isn't any gap between them. There's just a wall, just two layers of bricks thick. And that's what happens with your cells, because your cells, they can't allow stuff just to slip in and out between them. There is actually a, a, a journal called Tissue Barriers. Can you believe it? Which I read sometimes, because yeah, not for any, for any enjoy, enjoyment. But um, And one of the, and I can't remember the exact quote, is that, that um, if it's called tight tight junctions between cells that are like locked and zippered and and just enormously complicated barriers to anything getting between them. It's called there's, there's about five different forms of these things, and then they're in their journal they say tight barrier tight junctions are essential for mammalian life because if you cannot control the movement of ions and all sorts of things out of the bloodstream into the what they call the extracellular fluid, interstitial fluid, you're dead, all right? You're dead instantly. So in order in order for the LDL hypothesis to work, um, you can't have a barrier that, that, to stop LDL getting through, and we have to have these barriers. There's a disease called Ebola, which you've heard of, and people have everyone's heard of Ebola. It kills like 80% of people get infected by it, and you think, well, but how does it kill you? What does it do? And what it does is the Ebola virus, for reasons that I have absolutely no reason why it does this, it is capable of opening up the tight junctions between cells and they just open up and then stuff gets out of the blood and you get bloodshot eyes you get your, your tongue and things fall off you get internal bleeding hemorrhagic fever you pee blood because it's coming out of your bladder and your kidneys are releasing blood into your bladder and your kidneys and then you die and it's a horrible terrible death but the actual process of dying is opening up barriers between cells for the ldl hypothesis to work you have to open up barriers between cells now i don't see everybody just die right now in front of my eyes yeah. it's just so the hypothesis requires an impossible process to work it's not a difficult it's not a, well that's quite a difficult thing to achieve process it's not like climbing to the top of mount everest which is tricky but you can do it it's it's impossible you'd be like walking to the moon and yet that is the hypothesis that we're supposed to believe in. Well, this is how the, uh, our science has worked mm -hmm. in the past hundred years. And people latch onto these theories and don't let them go. I mean, I guess that's what I'm trying to do with my film and everything I do is just reverse this thinking. And we're just stuck like this. I, I, how, why are we so stuck like this? Big industries latch onto these ideas and perpetuate them. And there's big, huge curriculums and institutions perpetuating these. And that's just what's in the textbooks. Well, it is. I mean, well, it's always been this case. I mean, in the actual, the man who published Einstein's special theory of relativity was Max Planck, who ran the 
Journal of Physics. They had such things as a Journal of Physics you know, in, in those days because there was only about 10 journals in it. Uh, and his famous quote is, science progresses one funeral at a time. And that's 120 odd years ago. So he knew, and we all know that, that unfortunately, it's not it's not just money though. Somebody else just asked me this recently, and I said, "It's I don't know if you ever seen the film Inception, where they're trying to insert an idea into someone's head. I mean, it's so complete baloney. Yeah, that was a great film, but, but yeah. yeah. Anyway, the idea is, how do you get an idea in someone's head without them thinking it's not my idea, it's somebody else's idea? But the the the, the strap line of the film is, what's the most resilient parasite known to man? The answer is an idea." And ideas are enormously difficult to shift. Get it in there, get it stuck in there, build a kind of framework around it. And, you know, people find it really, really difficult to change their ideas. It's just extraordinary. I sometimes say, I'll do a joke, because I live near Manchester, and Manchester's got two football clubs, soccer clubs. Manchester United and Manchester City, all right, and where I live is just a bit south, and and it's about split 50-50 between Manchester United and Manchester City fans. If you're a Manchester United fan, you cannot ever in your life ever become a Manchester City fan. Mm -hmm. That would just be an impossible thing. Mm -hmm. you, you, you lose all your friends. Yeah. They won't hate you. You can't say one day, my team's a bit rubbish, I think I'll go and support them because they're a lot better. It's just, just, you know, I mean, but what stops somebody, you know, becomes... It's an impossible task to get somebody to, to even, you, know, you define yourself as a Manchester United supporter by how much you hate Manchester City and vice versa. Even though some families have, you know, father and daughter are Manchester United supporters and mother and son are Man City supporters and they live in the same house. So it's, and they, they don't kill each other all the time, but it is incredibly difficult. So H.L. Mencken, who's an American, you've probably heard of, he said, for every complicated solution, every complicated problem is a solution. It's simple, easy to understand, and wrong. Mm -hmm. If you can mm -hmm. come up with that idea and you can plant your flag in early, which is what Ansel Keys did, and you can say, this is it, and then you can gather people around you, and then you've can you you, you you've got it, if you like. I mean, creating the wrong idea in the first place is, is relatively simple. Trying to change a wrong idea once it's got in there is just, just different. It's so difficult. Yeah, it's like w turning around the world's biggest ship. It's just that once it gets hold, you're like a moron if you don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, this is what I'm I encounter because I'm trying to say the opposite of a lot of nutrition ideas, and people are just like, "Oh, this guy's dumb," <laughs> because the momentum it has. All right, what are some high level stuff? Because you talked about some of these these detailed reasons why it's not cholesterol, but there's some big, just easy to understand stuff like the the r mortality risk of cholesterol, like actually goes up. If you have low cholesterol, <laughs> no, no, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, in fact, I'm just my uh, my original mentor in the cholesterol world. If you're having a scoff, we just wrote another paper and uh, writing another paper, and it's the same stuff. It's the same idea. Yeah, people who have higher cholesterol, LDL, whatever term you want to use for it, which is one of the problems that no one ever pin you down. Once you reach the age of about 60, or it might be younger, because who knows, because every paper uses a different kind of point, it's impossible to ever get some any consistency. But anyway, once, you're, once you're past your prime middle age, the higher your LDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, particle number, APOA, whatever, the longer you live. I uh, sometimes say to people, it's like smoking. You say, well, if you're under 50 and you smoke, it causes lung cancer. But once you're over 50 and you smoke, it actually protects you against lung cancer. All right, right. Yeah, go talk me through that one again. <laughs> just, but that's what we're supposed to believe with cholesterol. Like, yeah, well, it causes heart disease before you're 55, but after 55, it doesn't. Uh, oh, it you live longer. Yeah, yeah, it helps you. The higher, the better. I know. So, I mean, it's like, what, what, what? I mean, all you need to do is look at the evidence. I mean, <clears throat> I looked at the evidence years ago and thought, well, this is bunk. And then I was trying to look at process of what actually causes heart disease. I was looking more, started looking more at the process and realized. Well, there's a, there's a mechanistic, there's a process argument against LDL, which is also makes it bunk. Um, but, you know, however, what, what is it that triggers someone to think is to even listen to you, isn't it? You know, it's bunk. It's clear, if you look at it, you've looked at it. Anyone I know with a brain that's looked at it, it's going, well, it's bunk, isn't it? And yet still. <coughs> well, no, it's like, it's just like the vegan stuff. It's arguing with vegans and, and the vegans have those. The vegans has those simple arguments you talk about, the simple arguments that are wrong. They're just like, oh, eating fat makes you fat or like eating an animal is bad. 
it's yeah. bad for the environment. And then there, you're, you're, if you don't look into it, you're just like, oh yeah, that sounds good. That sounds yeah. right. And then the minute you look into it, you understand that it's completely wrong. Well, <clears throat> I don't feel with veganism, is it? There's aspects of it that are nothing to do with health. I'm more just in the health. So many people want to say, I don't like eating animals. I go, well, fine, don't eat an animal then. He said to you. But don't tell me that, that your argument is it's unhealthy because it isn't. You know, let, Let's separate these discussions out. And then they bring in saving the world and a bowl of rice cats and wealth to get everything in. Like, well, which argument would you like? I can't have three arguments with you simultaneously. I'll just stick to the health argument, which is there is no evidence that eating animals is unhealthy for human beings. Quite the opposite, in fact. End of. You know? Go to France. Go to, go to Fr Try and have a vegetarian meal in France. <laughs> Well, I heard. Yeah, I heard some of those countries. They, they say you say you're vegetarian, and they just give you chicken and fish. Well, yeah, well, they no, they just take the meat off the plate and give you whatever. <laughs> or, yeah, just get a pile of pasta. That's right. but, yeah, they don't even get it. They're like, oh, you don't eat meat? Okay, well, here's chicken and fish. <laughs> yeah, I know the French are, are. They just look at you like you're, you're bonkers if you try and have a. I mean, it's slightly changed, but it is. Yeah, yeah. You look at them and you say, well, what's their rate of heart disease? Well, it's that. You know, it's that. It's, it's always been that, you know? And they go, oh, well, it's, it, it's what? And they said, oh, it's because they drink red wine. <sighs> and it's because they eat garlic. What? And it's because they likely cook their vegetables. It, you know, there's a thing that Popper calls ad hoc hypotheses, which is you can always find a reason why something isn't a contradiction. Because a contradiction isn't a contradiction. So, like, you know, with them, with, with them, at one point, women have higher LDL levels than men in general. Maybe not much higher, but it's higher. And they generally have a heart disease rate that's about a third or a fifth of that of the surrounding male population. You take all the factors out of consideration, control for them, you still got the same situation. So for many years, it was said, ah, oh, women are protected by their sex hormones. You go, yeah. Why? Well, the only reason why you're saying that is because you can't think of anything else. And it's the only thing that could possibly be different. So that was it. And at one time in the U.S., there was guidelines to give women who reached the menopause HRT to protect them against heart disease. And then they did a couple of actual experiments, and they found that it increased your risk of heart disease. Nightmare, yeah. And Someone went, replacement therapy, yeah, it was a nightmare. And then they went, oh, oh, we didn't expect that. But so what does cause women to have less heart disease then? Eh? 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 Any ideas? No, you haven't got any ideas. But you still, we're told it's female sex hormones. I mean, okay. I won't go into the hundreds of studies I've looked at where, where they've looked at sex hormones and found nada. And maybe slight increase in risk. It's not a huge increase in risk, but it ain't the sex hormones, so you don't know what you're talking about, you know? Well, let's let's go back to what does cause heart disease because we, di we didn't exactly name your theory. We'll call it the thromb thrombogenic hypothesis, right? Well, yeah, well, um, I kind of call it the thrombogenic hypothesis. Thrombo meaning blood clot and Genesis obviously means the creation of. So thrombogenic hypothesis just means that it's blood clots. So blood clots, blood clots, blood clots. That's what causes it. I mean, ironically, of course, the mainstream thought or thinking or hypothesis doesn't... Almost everyone will tell you, yeah, when you have a heart attack or a stroke, it's a blood clot that causes it. 99.9% .9 of the time it is. So you've got an artery in your heart, and it's already narrowed with a... Instead of being this wide, it's this wide which means it's more likely to be blocking and obviously the endothelium overlying, it's not in great shape. Bang, stimulates a big blood clot, blocks the entire blood vessel, blood doesn't get through, that's called an infarction. In your neck, you can get plaques and, and what tends to happen is the plaques in your neck break off, bits and break off and go into your brain and that's called a cerebral infarction. Blood clots. So how do you treat, you know, what's our treatment? Well, we go in and we put stents in and we open up the blood clot and we open up the blood flow. We give people anticoagulants. You know, we, we do everything. It's blood clot management. I call, you know, strokes and heart attacks. Acute cardiovascular incidents is like blood clot management. That's what you're doing. You're managing the blood clot. They used to give a thing called TPA, which is clot buster, which breaks the blood clot apart, and people take aspirin and whatever they take. So it's, um, no, that, that's, not, that's not really controversial, that blood clots are the final, the final bit of oh, atherosclerotic heart disease. And you can read, I can show you 100 papers that, when when you get a, a plaque as a thinning, a thickening in the artery wall, the thing that causes it to grow tends to be that you get a, a blood clot forms on top of it, not big enough to block the artery so you don't get a heart attack or a stroke, narrow it. Then that blood clot is incorporated into the artery wall 
and that's what causes the plaque to grow. And you can see the journal's called atherosclerosis. I mean, you want to read a boring journal, there you go. But mm -hmm. you know, I've got papers from atherosclerosis saying, yep, this is how blood clots, this is how plaques grow. And I'm reading an interesting paper saying, you know, if you do oh, intravenous uh, ultrasound scans or just any other scan on the heart to look at people who've known to be having heart disease and they've got known thinning, thickenings in their arteries, the plaques they don't they don't they don't sort of grow like that what happens is they just go they suddenly go ping next time i look it's bigger it's so not, for people it's not who aren't watching this on youtube yeah it's it's not a gradual that you did a gradual motion it's uh, all of a sudden it's an all of a sudden yes it's what they call physic rather than linear was the terms they use in other words it jumps in size all of a sudden it's not it's not like one molecule of ldl building up on top of another molecule of ldl what's happening is it's like it's it's three wide. I'm not going to use any millimeters or micromillimeters. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly it's six wide. Mm -hmm. All right. The next year it's six wide. So they said, well, this is clearly what's happening is there's a blood clot that's formed on that area. It's been healed over. A new layer of endothelium is on top. And now you've got a thicker plaque. Now, that, that is not really controversial. So we know that plaques, once they're there, grow through blood clot formation. We know that the final event in a heart, in cardiovascular disease, is blood clot formation. But what you can't get anyone to accept is that that's what causes it to start in the first place. It's LDL. So LDL gets gradually into some parts of some arteries somewhere for some reason that we can't understand through a process that's incomprehensible. And after that, will it give you blood clots? I said, well, I can give you blood clots right from the start because that's what is happening. And that explains what you see. You can see, you can actually see some of the, some, some plaques in the arteries or like tree rings, you can see layer after layer after layer after layer after layer, like tree growing. You say, well, how did LDL do that? Well, it didn't, obviously. What did that was, you had a blood clot, got shaved down. Another blood clot, got shaved down. Another blood clot, got shaved down. One on top of the other, bang, bang, bang. That is, it's called multi-layered. You can read the American Heart Association. They had a 500-page thing on trying to define atherosclerotic plaques. Can you believe it? I mean, what a boring, boring thing that was. I did read all the way through it, I think. I can't remember. I fell asleep several times. But mm -hmm. but when you got down to it, it was like it's multi-layered, multi-layered. And when you tried to find cholesterol, it was like, where is it? Well, it's sort of in there somewhere, you know. Well, and so, you know, it, they, they themselves will agree. So <coughs> what, I'm tr what, what, what the thrombogenic hypothesis says is the first step is a blood clot forms on a damaged artery wall that was previously healthy. So that clot. Most of the time, that clot's got rid of and gone, and you wouldn't even know it was there. But sometimes, the other one forms quickly. If there's reasons for damage at that point, but there are things that more likely to damage the artery wall, you get a kind of vulnerable area, and that becomes a place where more and more blood clots are likely to be located, and that becomes a thickening, and that becomes a narrowing, and finally, bang, it blocks completely. So it's well, just the same process. Yeah. See this, so this explains everything. I'll, I'll kind of reiterate this again. The LDL thing's a joke. We got to put it to rest. It doesn't explain barely anything. The, you know, it's the most cherry pick thing you can think of. The thrombogenic <laughs> hypothesis explains why all the different factors in heart disease, which are varied, they're you know all over the place. And the, we're kind of recapping the first half of your book right now. Is is just going through all of this on why. The thrombogenic hypothesis makes sense and why it explains all these disparate ways that heart disease is caused. So we know that it's caused by smoking. We know that it's caused by all these super different things. Yet this is the common factor that all makes sense. Yes. Well, I sometimes say to people, it's a bit like getting rust on your car, car door, or car paintwork. And um, if you're going to achieve that, the first thing you have to do is you have to damage the paintwork in some ways. Some cars will rust without any damage to the paintwork. But in general, nowadays, if you're going to get rust forming, you have to scrape the paintwork. Then the water gets in, then the, then the, 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 the salt yeah. gets in, and blah, blah, blah. But So what can damage the paintwork in your car? Have a think. Well, I can think of 200 things. I, give me half an hour and give you 500 things that can damage the paintwork in your car. And you can say it's like a key missing the lock and scratching the car, or, or a tin of baked beans falls out of your shopping and hits the car or another car hits your car or a, a, a sharp bush hits your car you say well what you know if you're saying let's look at these things well we've got we've got tin of baked beans we've got, we've got, a, a, we've got a, a, a key we've got a, a sharp bush we've got a stone we've got another car what 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 brings these things together 
what brings these things together is not what they are because they have no connection of what they are. They are completely different things. Yeah, icicle. Yeah, the question is, what, yeah. what, what can they do? They can all, in certain circumstances, damage the paintwork on your car. And that aspect of what they are that you should be interested in is the process of damage to your car paintwork. And so when you're looking at heart disease, say, well, what, what, what brings together diabetes and smoking? And um, high blood pressure and infectious diseases, and say, give you a one out of the blue sickle cell anemia, which I talk about in the book. Or, you know, what what connects these things? Well, they are completely different things, they're completely different diseases and conditions, but they can all, and you can measure it, you can see it, they can all damage the glycocalyx and the endothelium. They can all do this, they do it in different, slightly different ways. But that's what they're doing. So they're actually the process is the same, no matter what the causal agent is. And this is where the thinking went wrong. Was like trying to find the single thing that caused heart disease. It's what they call, you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's desire to find an answer that's simple. So they, they found this LDL and then they hammered it into the square peg into the round hole and said that fits, and and that's it. And everything else just you know has to fit around this. So, the one thing I cannot see evidence any evidence for is that is that LDL in any shape or form can damage the endothelium and the glycocalyx. I can't see that it does that. I can't see that it does it because it doesn't do it. It has no role in it, you know. Well, we should look at some of these examples because you mentioned like diabetes and smoking and sickle cell. Those are three good examples. So let's start with sickle cell and, and how can that damage the endothelium? Well, I think this is the simplest of all, isn't it? Uh, and it's sickle cells. Red cells are normally like like donuts. So they don't have a real hole in the middle. It's just there. So sort of donut shaped and mm -hmm. squidgy and round. And sickle cells can be like, they're shaped like a sickle. Look at this a sickle moon. It's got a sharp end on it. Mm -hmm. All the ends are not particularly sharp, but some are very sharp. So instead of having round, soft, squidgy things flying around through your arteries, you've got round, soft, squidgy things and sharp, nasty, sticky, outy things. Sharp, nasty, sticky, outy things are going to damage the lining of your artery walls. Just They just don't. In fact, with sickle cell disease, um, there was a program on it on genetic therapy and CRISPR I was just watching. But um, with sickle cell disease, um, the children used to die very young of sickle cell disease. They didn't used to get past about the age of five. So they have to have repeated blood transfusion. There's another genetic treatment coming along. But once they allowed people to live for a bit longer through transplant they found that the major problem we're having was was basically cardiovascular disease basically atherosclerotic heart disease we're looking at a study on a 14 year old boy who went into hospital he got gangrene of his left foot he had to have his foot removed eventually and they examined him and found that every single major artery in his body was was riddled with calcified atherosclerotic heart disease his brother died age five of a stroke so this is the uh, this is actually the highest risk thing for cardiovascular disease. There is a, in one paper I looked at it's a fifty thousand percent increased risk of getting dying of cardiovascular disease. Some of it slightly goes through a different process. So basically, you have a sharp, pointy thing, and it and they're banging against mm -hmm. the endothelial cells, and they're stripping them off and damaging them. And and quite often the thing that happens in sickle cell disease is because your red cells are are kind of got rid of the the, the bad ones are got rid of when you spleen. So you just, people with sickle cell disease tend to have big spleens. Sometimes they rupture, which is a problem for them. But when they take the spleens out and they look at the spleens, they find that the arteries in the spleens are riddled with atherosclerosis. Right? Mm -hmm. They say, well, how does it cause it? Well, it's like, well, it couldn't be caused by anything. You know, I, I, actually, the paper that I read about this 14-year-old boy, they said that the physical damage or the, the atherosclerosis is due to endothelial damage due to the physical disruption of the endothelium due to the sickled cells. That's what they said in their paper. We're going, yeah, uh, hold on. <laughs> How about reading what you just read and said, mm -hmm. that's the same thing that's causing it in, in, in diabetes. Well, how does diabetes do it? Well, we now know that a raised blood sugar level, and probably there's other things going on as well, but just say it's a raised blood sugar level, attacks and destroys the glycocalyx. So the glycocalyx layer is thinned and damaged. So instead of saying being this thick, it's like, Instead of being one mm. one centimeter thick, which it isn't, it's like a third of a centimeter thick. Mm. So the underlying endothelial cells are no longer getting the protection. All all the factors that live in the glycocalyx forest, the nitric oxide, the anticoagulant factors, all these things have been 
diminished. So things are more likely to stick to the artery walls, you get more damage to the artery walls, and you get effectively it's like a slightly reduced destruction compared to sickle cell disease. But of course with diabetes, all your blood vessels have this glycocalyx, including the very smallest ones. The capillaries, the capillaries are about a hundredth of the thickness of a human hair. That's the smallest you can get to get a red blood, red blood cell to squeeze through. And what you can see in diabetes is, is you're losing the glycocalyx, and even these very small blood vessels are getting damaged. So if you look at the back of someone's eye, you can see hemorrhages, and you can see exudates, you can see the blood vessels are destroyed and missing and cause aneurysms. You can't have an atherosclerotic plaque in a capillary because there is not room for it. It couldn't exist. But you can still get damage to these small vessels. This is called small vessel disease. And it's one of the big problems with diabetes because with diabetes you also get problems. With, you get problems with your eyesight because of the damage to the small blood vessels in your eyes. You get damage to your kidneys because the small blood vessels in your kidneys are essential for the function of the nephron. And you get damage to your peripheral nerves because right at the very end where the blood vessels are very small, they're starting to break down so the nerves are not getting sufficient blood or oxygen so they start to die so there's another problem with diabetes is you get numbness in your fingers and your feet because of that you're more likely to get ulcers in your fingers and your feet and because the blood supply is damaged because the small vessels are damaged then these ulcers and things are much less easy to heal and therefore quite often they become infected and the commonest reason why people have their legs amputated is because of diabetes because the blood circulation has been destroyed both at the large vessel and small vessel. Um, particularly smoking can do this as well. You've seen people who smoke and end up having their arms removed and stuff like that. I remember seeing a patient once who had both arms had been amputated and they had a little stump and attached to the stump they had a, a little wire contraption. It was attached to cigarettes so they could still smoke. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it helps smoke. Oh, it's, that's uh, fine. Good. You know, you think, well, what else can you do? I suppose it would, well, you've lost everything you can, so. You might as well. Um, Screw so it. Anyway, the smoke, then, then you've got, the, what did we say, smoking? Was the mm -hmm. other one? Yep, smoking. <laughs> well, smoking, you say, well, I was smoking. You know, there was an advert in the UK, and I don't know if they had it in the States, where people were smoking a cigarette. And at the end of it was like goo coming out. Like they said, this is the fatty stuff that comes out that then sticks into your arteries. You're like saying, so how much fat is there in the average cigarette? Well, that would be none. So how does the non existent fat in the cigarette get into your arteries? Well, it's just. It's, 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 Anyway, no one seems to even bother that that's a thought. But if you smoke a cigarette, what happens in your lungs is obviously your lungs that have to allow things to pass in and out of them. That's when something's very small, like what they call a nanoparticle, a certain size, it can pass between the bloodstream and the air in your lungs, if you like, and get absorbed into your into your bloodstream. At one time, they tried to get inhaled insulin. So you'd inhale insulin instead of having to inject it. But the problem was it was very variable how much insulin got in. It didn't really work. But certain substances can get in and out of your lungs if they're small enough. So cigarette smoke, the nanoparticles, they come in, they get into your bloodstream, they bang up against your endothelium, and they kill your endothelial cells. And you can measure this. You can actually measure what they call the microparticles. So you can see that healthy volunteers were given one cigarette to smoke. They smoke one cigarette. You can measure microparticles in their bloodstream. You can see that their endothelial cells were being killed off. And, and that's how it does it. That's just, it's very simple. And of course, air pollution does exactly the same thing. If you've got small, small particle air pollution from like diesel smoke and diesel, and diesel engines, that'll cause the same thing. You know, people who, who worked in the mines, who got, they got pneumoconiosis. It's not quite the same because some of the dust particles from coal are too big to get through. So you get lung damage, but you also get damage in your, in your bloodstream as well. So you get heart disease. The, the, the highest risk factor, well, looking at like 100 and, it was 76 risk factors analyzed in the uk and then in in it was an ai paper found that the number one risk factor for heart disease is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease which means damage to your lungs so if you've got lung damage that lung damage will end up being cardiovascular damage and it's the same process it's damage to your endothelium and your glycocalyx so it's like almost name a factor you know like saying to people here's a game what causes an increase in heart disease right I'll show you how it happens through the process. The magic of endothelial and glycocalyx damage and or bigger or more damaging blood clots are formed. And, and you know, give me any of the... You know, of course, it doesn't work because some of the factors that we have as risk factors are not risk factors. So one of the risk factors in the UK risk engine, which is called QRIS3, is, is like um, erectile dysfunction. So, yeah. The problem here is that erectile dysfunction is caused by cardiovascular disease 
so it don't, can't possibly cause it. <laughs> it's an association. So you have to be very careful because some people say, uh, what about whatever? And you think, well, yeah, I know that people who are in, the, in this situation are more likely to get heart disease, but that's an association. It's not causal. And we've just bundled an awful lot of things together and just said, your, your risk is increased if you are whatever, you know, postcode is the case, zip code in the States. How does having a zip code cause heart disease? You know, well, it's not zip code. It means that you live, usually means you're a socially deprived area of, of the country and therefore you probably smoke you may drink you may have a, all sorts of shitty things going on in your life you may not take exercise you may blah 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 so it's you know you have to be careful with some of the risk factors but in general things like so in the uk version it's called q risk three it's got one of its risk factors is rheumatoid arthritis and you think gosh they put rheumatoid arthritis in there what's that got to do with ldl well it's got nothing to do with ldl obviously because it's nothing to do with ldl why did they put it there how does rheumatoid arthritis cause the same thing? Well, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, which I talked about before, they're also vasculitis. In other words, they cause inflammation of the blood vessels, the lining of the blood vessel. They have that as one of the things they do. There are about 20 different vasculitis. Vasculitides is what you call them, actually, as a plural form. And they're from scleroderma to, <coughs> to um, huge disease to SLE to whatever. And they're all joined together because what they do at one point is is the body decides that the lining of the arteries is something it doesn't like very much and it starts to attack them. And once that happens, of course, this is just a bit of a disaster. So the immune system, and this is what we see with, with SARS-CoV-2, is the immune system looks at an endothelial cell that's been infected by a, by a SARS-CoV-2 virus and goes, I don't like the look of that. And it attacks it and it kills it. <coughs> Yeah, so what we're seeing with SARS-CoV-2 is is a vasculitis. You've heard of multi-system, no, what's it called multi-system inflammatory disorder in SARS-CoV-2. Some children get this thing where they get what they call multi-system disorder. Well, what is that's happening is the body is is the virus is getting into the endothelial cells because the endothelial cells have the receptors that allow the virus to get in. They attack it, you get inflammation, and which is why you're getting blood clots. And then people are saying, well, you get a lot of heart disease get myocarditis, following SARS-CoV-2 infection. I'm not going to discuss vaccination. Well, it's not a surprise because this is what happens. There's a condition that affects young people, young children, called Kawasaki's disease, which was discovered in Japan where it's more common. And no one actually knows what causes it, but what we do know is it's an acute vasculitis. The blood vessels are, are, are inflamed. And children can get Kawasaki's disease at age four, and then have a heart attack age five. So you can get super accelerated atherosclerotic damage with vasculitis. So when people say to me, all oh, right, oh, well, that's the same thing then, isn't it? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. You're damaging the lining of your artery walls, and this is triggering blood clots. And so you, you can bring anything you like to this party, and you can say, all right, well, that was cocaine use. You might or may not know that cocaine use is associated with a big... Increasing cardiovascular risk, especially so young men who use cocaine are very likely to get die of heart attacks. You say, well, what's happening? You know, if you take cocaine, the middle of your nose falls off. Why does the middle of your nose fall off? Because cocaine triggers damage and vasculitis to the blood vessels in your nose. So it dies, so it falls out. You say, well, if it's causing that degree of vasculitis in your nose, what the hell do you think it's doing throughout the rest of your body? Mm -hmm. It's causing an acute vasculitis around your whole body and then your body the inflammation glycocalyx endothelial damage blood clot formation cardiovascular disease dead so you know i would say to people you're going to have a hypothesis that explains heart disease you have to explain okay here's the thing way over here all right and here's another thing way over here another thing way over here now we know that they increase the risk of cardiovascular disease your job is to work out how they all do it and the how has to be the same. Otherwise, it's not the same disease. And so while things might seem a million miles apart, a bit like the baked beans and the stone and the key, they're all doing the same thing. They're doing it in a very different way. And they look very different and they sound very different. And they, of course, they are very different. But what they're doing, they're all focusing in on this thing. This is what they do. They get to the artery wall and they damage it. 
that's you know you, you yeah there are some other things that can cause heart disease that are to do with damage to the repair systems because obviously once you've damaged the arterial wall and you've got a plaque a, a blood clot it, it needs to be covered over it needs to be got rid of it needs to be treated you know, the body needs to do its thing and get rid of it so the, there is there is a drug which i've discussed in the book but it's a it's called bevazicumab the other name for it's avastin it's an anti-cancer drug now the purpose of this anti-cancer drug is you have a thing in your bloodstream it's called vascular endothelial growth factor it's produced it makes new blood vessels it makes new endothelial cells it stimulates the whole process of going you know thalidomide the reason why it caused the problems it caused is because it blocked this factor vascular endothelial growth factor it blocked it in the children in the uterus which meant that the blood vessels could not grow in their arms and their legs so their arms and their legs could not grow because the blood vessels didn't grow so their arms and their legs became terribly shortened so the deformities of thalidomide were due to this effect this exact effect and thalidomide is now actually used as a drug to treat cancer because cancers solid cancers have to get nutrients and the way they get nutrients is they trigger this vascular endothelial growth factor release which means more new blood vessels are created which means that the tumor is then supplied with new nutrients so if you block that then you can kill the tumour, something dead if you like. It's quite clever, isn't it? Now, you think, aha, but you're doing something here, aren't you? And what you're doing is you're blocking vascular endothelial growth factor, which is hugely important for the development of new endothelial cells, for the nurturing of endothelial cells, for the production of nitric oxide, for the production of endothelial progenitor cells in the bone marrow. So I see a potential problem here. You're going to get heart disease, aren't you? Well, at least you stopped the cancer. What? Oh, yeah. Well, it's about, you know, it's balancing out. You know, when people say, I oh, look at, because um, Viagra, Sildenafil, increases nitric oxide synthesis, and that improves endothelial health and growth and blah, blah, blah. And there's some studies from the UK showing that people who use Viagra, who've had a heart attack previously, are, I think it was 60% less likely to die of heart disease in the next six years. Whether that's entirely due to the Viagra, or who knows, but you can see that potential association but you can see equally you know you take a drug that increases nitric oxide synthesis and protects your endothelial cells and your glycogenic that's good it's not very good if you happen to have a bit of a slow growing tumor on board which then says ah i can now make more blood vessels and they can grow and they can become really big so you know medicine's not you know there is no magic kind of thing that you can go ah i'll wave this and everything works really. be careful because it's actually a bazooka you know Oh yeah, there, there, <laughs> that's all the context. But I wanted to talk about the nitric oxide stuff, and you mentioned erectile dysfunction as as one of these associations with heart disease. So yeah, go go more into the NO, the nitric oxide stuff. Well, nitric oxide is chemical which um, no one believed existed until it found it did exist because NO is is NO minus sign. It's got free radical. It's enormously it's enormously reactive substance. It's a it's a gas if you got enough molecules together. And it, and it should really, it's called the freest of free radicals, really. And everyone says free radicals are bad for you, but actually nitric oxide turns out to be extremely good for you. Um, and it, it is synthesized in your endothelium, um, and it's the most potent anticoagulant factor we know of. Also, when it's synthesized, it, it stimulates production of endothelial uh, progenitor cells. It causes dilation of the blood vessels, so they open up. And in fact, this is where, in the, in, in a roundabout way, where it was discovered was that, that workers at Nobel's factory making nitroglycerin, actually dynamite, you make dynamite is made with making nitroglycerin and putting it into some form of clay. But the people who were stirring the nitroglycerin knew an angina, and their angina went away. And they said, ah, so they turned the out angina, to which is like heart narrowing disease. the blood vessels in your heart, cramping and lack of blood supply in your heart. So they were opening up the blood vessels, and people said, well, how does that work? You know, so they didn't know how it worked. But well, they made this stuff called, they called it glycerol trinitrate rather than nitroglycerin. It's the same thing. You stuck it under your tongue, got absorbed into your bloodstream, opened up the blood vessels in your heart, the angina went away. Magic. <clears throat> and if Viagra came along, it was actually designed for angina because it increased nitric oxide synthesis. Uh, but it wasn't very good at angina. But when they did the clinical trials, the volunteers didn't give their tablets back. And they said, why didn't you give me your tablets back? And they eventually discovered the reason why they gave the tablets back is it was giving them a very sustained erection and the reason for that is an erection is caused by nitric oxide in the penis 
is that it's a slightly different pathway. <clears throat> so therefore, if you've got cardiovascular disease, it means you've got widespread atherosclerotic problems going on, which means you've got problems in your penis, in your blood vessels there. So the reason what the reason why Viagra works is it overcomes that and it increases the nitric oxide synthesis and it opens up the blood vessels and you, you, you gain an erection. Now that that's exactly how it works. It's not very cool, but it's amazing how interacted it all is, isn't it? And so therefore, I mean, you can actually get nitroglycerin cream and and, and rub it onto the penis and then it causes it, it creates an erection. And it's actually called dynamite cream, I believe, having mm. never used it, obviously. <laughs> so um, so we'll go back to Nobel and his dynamite and his nitric oxide. So this substance, this nitric oxide, is hugely important to your health of your blood vessels. Now, weirdly, I mean, people said, oh, you eat beetroot, it's got nitrates. If you eat vegetables that have got nitrates, it's, it's actually it's quite good for your cardiovascular system. Slightly weirdly that this happens, but it's true. So, yes, you want nitric oxide. And other, other things that can stimulate nitric oxide are things like exercise. And one of the most important things to stimulate nitric oxide is sunlight. Boom. I was about to say sunlight. Another but another benefit of sunlight. It's only recently been discovered that sunlight on your skin causes it to manufacture, synthesize, and release nitric oxide into your system. It lowers your blood pressure, has benefits on your heart, did da did da So, you know, all these things kind of it's come around. And, of course, we're all told to avoid the sun because otherwise mm. we'll all die of sun cancer. We, another load of whatever. But um, so <laughs> the, the, the nitric oxide... A correlation is very important and if you get if you get drugs that reduce nitric oxide synthesis that can have some quite serious problems one of the most common ones that are used is um is called omeprazole pantoprazole i don't know what they're called in uh in the states is, is this, the names they sell them they're called ppi inhibitors just to reduce mm -hmm. acid in your stomach and they uh, they also um reduce nitric oxide synthesis through a slightly weird pathway in your endothelial cells uh, and people taking these drugs are, are at higher risk of developing heart disease and again it just it's the same thing it figures back well of course if it does this it's going to do that if you give people bisavicumab or avastin it's going to cause heart disease it just is because it's it's interfering with the repair processes and nitric oxide is you could call it a part of a repair process some some people have got it was al arginine is the thing isn't it arginine is is the protein l arginine is a protein that is is a cofactor in the production of nitric oxide in your endothelial cells and the glycocalyx so if you can take l arginine it's probably not a bad thing to do if you're having things like angina or you think you've got cardiovascular problems because l arginine will usually and l carnitine the, the two things are Mm. almost interchangeable will increase your nitric oxide synthesis and will improve your cardiovascular system we we know this and mm. it all comes back to this it's the same thing again and again it's not very complicated mm -hmm. <coughs> once you've what what you've said is this it's like oh i can see how that does it oh yeah that's mm -hmm. always how that does it it's always how this does it it all comes together here we're running out of time here but there's one another one stress cortisol see see if we can do this oh, yeah, pretty yeah. quickly why why this is the same type of thing going on? Well, the big, it was a big one for me. Was uh, and I still believe that uh, I'd like to use the word strain rather than stress, but I'm not getting into that. Is that psychological stress, negative stress, and it can increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and all sorts of other diseases as well. How does that happen? Well, there are many reasons, but keeping it simple, if you are constantly chronically stressed, your cortisol level goes wrong. It may go up, it may go down, but it goes wrong when you measure it. Cortisol is a direct antagonist to insulin at almost all sites of action. So you're more likely to develop raised blood sugar levels. Cortisol is actually an anti-inflammatory and you use it to stop healing, if you like. That's why we give it to people, is to stop the inflammatory response. And so therefore, if you've got damage going on to your artery walls and your whatever, Cortisol will impair the healing systems that are going on. So it, it causes problems at both ends of the spectrum. And also cortisol and chronically raised stress means that your body produces more clotting factors, which is not really a surprise. The system is designed to protect you under, under situations of threat. So a bear walks out of the woods. Your system goes, ah, at which point your heart rate goes up. All sorts of stuff happens. But your blood clotting factors are increased, stimulated, so your blood's much more likely to clot. So being under chronic stress means your blood is what they call hypercoagulable. 
So you can you get you get the high glucose and the damage to the to the to the endothelium. You get more blood clotting, and you get an impact on the the um, the healing systems. So you get really all three. And in fact, you know, we can see that people who have um, who take long term steroids, which are corticosteroids, which basically cortisol, slightly adapted forms of it, are, are at much higher risk of, of, of dying of heart disease. So, in fact, the chronic stress, psychosocial stress, whatever term you want to use for it, on a, on a, on a kind of population basis, I think is one of the most important risk factors for heart disease. So it's like take a chill pill. You know, if you've got a, if you've got a really difficult job, bullying boss, under a lot of stress, try and work out ways to get out of that. If your relationships around you are toxic or not very helpful, sort these things out. I mean, exercise itself, exercise can reset part of the stress response. So that that in itself is a good thing to do. Going outside in the sunshine and walking in the countryside, remarkable effect on 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 your whole stress system. So these are really good things as well. But again, it comes back to the triad of endothelial damage. Increased blood clot formation and interference with the stress repair systems, and they're all they're all under attack when you're under chronic stress. And chronic stress that goes back to the postcode or zip code, where oh, yeah. Yeah, right? It's like these people living in these really bad areas; they are under a lot of chronic stress. They're yeah, financial yeah, they stress, are. all yeah. kinds of stuff. I looked at a study from I think it was South Africa showing people who are under financial stress men men are more likely to respond in negative ways to stress than women which if we'll go into that's not enough time is why they tend to have higher rates of heart disease that the stress response is different and more toxic I mean, in this uh, study in south africa men who were under financial stress were over a five-year period 13 times more likely to die of a heart attack you know i mean that's just major major you know and <coughs> i think it for most people this is the one well, there are other things, but for most people, this is the one I would recommend looking first at and saying, you know, are you are you under negative chronic stress? Because you really got to work that one out. Yeah, and that and that's a hard one too. You can't just tell someone to all of a sudden get out of a bad neighborhood or. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no. Well, I mean, a lot of it comes from internally, anyway. So I would say you could give people a million dollars or a million pounds, and they would just have the same life with just slightly more expensive yeah. stuff. They. they people almost create a world around them that's stressful so oh. you, you know oh, yeah it's your perception it's really yeah how you react to your situation is what matters not your situation oh, absolutely you know if you learn bad coping mechanisms and you know you do a, <coughs> right. you do a will smith and uh, go and batter somebody <laughs> you need to be calm <laughs> you need to be chilled that's a sign of great underlying um Dysfunctional responses to, to external stimuli. We call it that. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so many things. Okay, so I, I, I want to recommend the book. To <laughs> it's called The Clot Thickens. There's so many more details we could have got into about all this stuff, evidence for supporting the thrombogenic hypothesis. Uh, you even found studies that show there are at least one study that says that the, the thrombogenic material is therefore sufficient on its own to induce plaque formation. I wrote that down. Uh, you, you highlighted that. So there, yeah, there's so much evidence going on in the last couple of minutes. I mean, we started trying, we started moving towards advice on how to not get heart disease. So maybe we can just go into that. We, we started talking about the lifestyle factors and how to reduce stress and go outside and exercise and all these types of things. But uh, what else, what else do you have? Well, I'd say there's a Dr. Kendrick formulation that is very cheap and you can buy it at your local chemist, but uh, there's no such thing, um, <laughs> unfortunately, that I can become rich out of. But, you don't uh, have a snake yeah. oil to sell us. I don't have a snake oil. It's terrible. I, it's, um, I think that um, from a population level, yes, the, the stress thing's big. The, the diabetes, the, don't, don't get your blood sugar up and keep it up and whatever, and that's probably the area you are particularly probably know a lot more than I do is stop eating stop eating buns you know i don't mind people going to mcdonald's if you eat the burgers you're fine the trouble is everyone has a five five pints of coca-cola and a packet of fries this size and a bun this size you think it's just, this is just a high carbohydrate meal that's the problem with it is it, watch out what you're eating eat natural food stuff that looks like food if you like um and 
that you know i'm not going to say you know you can go into this stuff you can say eat this and eat that and then it gets incredibly complicated eat natural stuff do exercise don't smoke if you're obese and you're struggling with blood sugar levels go on to a high fat less i'm saying high protein a high fat low carbohydrate diet go have fasting so that you have periods where your body can actually get itself kind of sorted out and um um there are one or two supplements that can be beneficial for your overall health. But if you're eating well and you're doing everything else well, you probably don't need these things particularly. But if you are unwell, you might need them. I'm not going to go into those sort of things. And there are some particular and specific conditions that you have to maybe watch out for that people don't necessarily tell you about, but probably don't have time to get into all of that. So it's it's pretty simple. My steps to health are not exactly earth shattering, but it's in a way it's just trying to say to you, well, why are they healthy? What are they doing? Don't take so many medications, especially in the United States where it seems to be bonkers. Can't believe it how many drugs people are taking over there. Oh, it's no. insane over here. And I just posted a quote by another doctor friend of mine that says, Judge your doctor by how many medications they try to get you off of. Yes. That's well, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've gone in. When I started in medical school, we were told that nobody should be on more than five drugs. I think it's changed, and then the advice now is nobody should be on less than five drugs. <laughs> That's yeah. the goal, yeah. Like, all right, you're not doing your job. They're only on four. Yeah. Do better. Yeah, get them on more. Yeah, no, you, that, that's good advice. All the stuff you said. I mean, people listening to this show can go back to a hundred, you know, forty other podcasts about this. Pretty much the same advice you gave. Uh, you yeah. Know, it, it's simple. Yeah. I mean, I have to do a whole six part series film on this and do 140 podcasts about the simplest thing, which is what we're saying, eating natural foods. And we're just eating what's come from nature, animal foods, you know, whatever side dishes you want to that, that are made from whole foods and get your sun, get your vitamin D, do your exercise. Yeah. It's so simple, but I got it. But it, no, it's good. <clears throat> To, to tell people why they need to do that or remind them or to go through the whole process of heart disease, then, you know, and you, you, you explained it all. So now, you know, why it's motivation, right? I, I think that's what people yeah. need, right? Well, I think it's removing the fear as well, because people have been made very fearful of things, haven't they, in the last, well, I'm probably older than you are, but you know, food is now, you, people look at food and it's like, it's the enemy, you know, it's like, enjoy it as much as anything else you know go to france go to france look at the way they eat look at the stuff they buy look at the way they buy it you know they go and they look at it and there's somebody talks about it and says this is this and, you know it's just the, the whole culture around it is just it's healthy you the know around it, it's just unhealthy <laughs> that's so good i did a whole episode with doc oh not doctor with mark schatzker he wrote the book the dorito effect and he also yeah. wrote um ah oh, i forget, just forget the end of crate craving yeah, yeah but he, he it's all about this in europe and how it's entirely different culture around food and yes even i even i don't even like diet culture that much too in the u.s because it's so people are so scared to eat certain things and they're so yeah. obsessed with different diets and they're like oh that's so bad for me I'm like i i'll eat i'll eat some chocolate i'll eat some ice cream i'll eat some pizza especially if yeah. i'm going to europe and i'm gonna you know enjoy it and it's if you're just fearful about and stressed out about eating a slice of pizza with your friends, it's probably going to do a lot more damage than just, well, you, eating, yeah, you, you know, you, you've also got to live your life for a bit of fun and enjoyment and fun and whatever is, 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 is critical to, to our existence. And we start, you know, we don't want to, you know, I do see some people and it is almost, it's to become obsessed and closed in on it. And it, it, it just, you know, come on, you know, it's out there. Well, it's going to cause a lot of stress. I mean, you talk a lot about stress and cortisol in the book because yeah. it's a huge, huge factor in heart disease. And yes, if you're always stressed out about what you're eating and making it a huge deal, it can be more harm than good. Well, I believe so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I love that. I, um, great message. I'm, man, I'm happy to talk to you. It's been years of me listening to your work. I feel like you've kind of just centered in on this idea like i guess uh, my last question is this has, has anything changed like over the years or is this is it all led to this kind of thrombogenic hypothesis or does everything kind of fit in because i've heard you talk about nitric oxide and do all yeah. these different podcasts on on your ideas over the years well i think it kind of has come together 
I mean, obviously, you know, you're a fool if you say that's it because it never is it. But I, I, uh, it's almost like you know, I just think, oh, got it, got it. You know, finally, all these years, mm-hmm. this is it. You know, clicks into um, place, kind of. This is the place. I mean, I just feel I'm, I feel I'm in the right place, and 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 it's it's like a, almost a an intellectual satisfaction when someone says, ah, but how did this do it? And I go, oh look, it does that. You know, it's it's it, it's kind of I don't know. Is it, it's like a getting Wordle in two goes or something. <laughs> <laughs> I've never it's, played it's, the Wordle game. I've never heard done it. Either. I don't I'm know what it is. I'm rubbish at that sort of thing. But you got to get, you got five, you guess five letters, and you get the green says it's the right letter in the right place, and whatever, whatever. It's a, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a variation on the theme of something I knew oh. years ago. But, but it is when you get something that just works. I think you just think, hey, you know what? That's it. That's it. Oh. That is it. You know, I'm happy with it. Yeah. I, I know what you mean, and it's just, it's not like the science has ever settled, and it's not like you're never going to be, you know, still working on this, but I, I feel that you've done this with heart disease, and I also feel like I, I'm a little bit like this in my nutrition ideas, where it's at peace, like you're at peace, because yeah. when a vegan comes around, or someone has any argument they can throw at me, like I can explain it, it makes sense to me, it fits into my model of just... You know, the simple whole food animal nutrition, animal foods are healthy. We're talking about protein and nutrients, which, you know, that you, you can't, you can show me any diet and I can tell you why it's good or why it's bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it makes sense. Everything makes sense. It's like, yeah. it's not like you, they call it, we talked about the French, they call it the, the cholesterol paradox or the saturated fat paradox, the French paradox. Yeah, it's yeah. not a paradox to me. Because for one, yeah. saturated fat's healthy, <laughs> but still like everything makes sense. You could show me. Um, a hunter gatherer living on the equator, eating, you know, a, a high carb diet, and I, and I and I and I'm that doesn't that doesn't go against my hypothesis because I didn't say whole food carb, you know, eating some tubers and eating they're eating fish, they're eating all natural foods. You can certainly do that, right? We're talking about you're talking <laughs> about the fries, the soda, the Americans, you know, what Americans yeah. eat. Well, That's yeah, completely you, different. You click a lot of factors and you. Eat. You don't do any exercise. Your life is stressful. You're eating too much of this, not enough of that, and it breaks down. You know, whereas you, you can keep yourself healthy with all sorts of things, but but the unhealth is you pile this on top of this on top of this, and then it, yeah. it all makes sense. It's really just the industrialization of the food. If we're talking about the food part, yeah. anything that that's highly refined is bad it's the simplest thing and so yes you can show me any culture they're eating unrefined foods they're not eating seed oils they're not no. eating refined grains and they're not eating sugar they're just eating natural food so of course they're healthy that doesn't disrupt my hypothesis at all of course they're healthy like no so all right great stuff i'll uh hold up the book one more time the clot thickens uh, I feel like it's an advertisement, but I bought this myself. We have no <laughs> affiliation. Feel, feel uh, free to advertise away. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you're not going to complain about the advertisement. So, do you have a website? Um, I've got a site. It's drmalcolmkendrick.org. So, you just if you type in Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, you'll find it. Um, and uh, and and um, I do occasional stuff on there. I'm going to be doing a bit more in the next couple of weeks. I've been a bit silent for reasons that will become apparent. <coughs> and um, yeah, well, I think it's, it's the debate and the discussion which is interesting to me. You know, I don't want to sort of say this is absolutely it, this is the end of it, and, and whatever. But but you know, let's have a debate about it, make it better. That's what I say. You know, <laughs> I like it, and and I like your views on the last two years. We could do a whole other podcast about. <laughs> What's gone on the last two years? We will leave that to another time, and uh, I won't get a strike on YouTube for. for yeah. hopefully. <laughs> but uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, and um, yeah, check out your website and check out the book, and hopefully, I'll talk again at some point. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>